You like that song, don't you? Sit down. Tea cakes, pancakes, everything you see. Won't we have a lovely time at half past three? <laughs> you like that song, don't you? Can you do this again? Ah. Can you do this one of the major differences between humans and other animals is our greater ability to make use of sensory information that we take in from our environment. Newborn babies don't appear to be very aware of their environment. They spend up to 20 hours a day sleeping, and when they're not sleeping, they're eating or having one of their other bodily needs attended to. The communication consists almost entirely of crying and gurgling, and they're totally dependent on another person for their survival. However, if we look more closely, we find that neonates, as newborns are sometimes called, have very strong reflexes. You can test some of these for yourself. Anything put in their hand will be firmly grasped, for example. It's said the grasping reflex is so strong that a newborn can be hung from a washing line. I don't think we'll put that to the test right now. The same reflex can be seen in the toes and feet at birth. The innate rooting reflex occurs in the neonate's cheek if it's touched. This occur allows the baby to find the nipple or bottle and use the very strong sucking reflex present at birth. These reflexes don't last forever, of course, and start to become voluntary during childhood. Babies are also born with sensory reflexes. For example, they can fix their gaze. And they'll follow a moving object. Other senses, such as taste and hearing, have recently been shown to be not only present at birth, but also develop very, very rapidly in the first few weeks of life. Amber, for example, at three weeks, will be able to discriminate her mother by now, by her voice and by her looks. Don't you? Yes. I'm not your mum. It's mummy. Amber. physical and mental experiences young babies have are used to develop more complex ways of understanding the world around them. This is cognitive development. How this development of understanding occurs has been and continues to be the source of much research. Jean Piaget was by far the most influential figure in this area of psychology and his theory has shaped the child rearing and educational practices of the Western world. Piaget was born in Switzerland in 1896 and died in 1980. For many years, his work was very unfashionable in psychology. The behaviourist approach dominated psychological research well into the 1950s, and this ruled out much interest in the study of thinking, cognition, or the mind. He published prolifically, but he wrote in French, which limited his readership in the early days. Piaget left us with an enormous amount of literature, as well as an enormous theory. The theory has been tested, analysed, criticised, and modifications have been suggested, but it's still widely accepted as the theory of cognitive development. We will try to understand the theory before going on later to a critical analysis. I say try because it is a theory which uses unfamiliar words and common sense ideas in a rather indigestible form. Basically, what Piaget is saying is that babies have innate, inborn abilities fairly primitive ones, but ones which are useful as a starting point to learning about the world. The baby then experiences the world and builds on his abilities to learn more and more pieces of behaviour. Piaget's studies convinced him that children are not just little adults, but they think in a qualitatively different way to adults. It may seem obvious to us now that this is the case, but it was a revolutionary idea 50 years ago. During childhood, we construct an understanding of reality by interacting with the environment. We're not born with full adult powers of thought, obviously. Um, thought, deduction, problem solving, creativity, etc. all come later. But must actively discover these cognitive skills. 
Piaget's theory attempts to explain how we build on innate muscular and sensory reflexes to achieve full adult thinking. It assumes that we have an inborn drive to organize and make sense of our environment. It also assumes that we have an innate ability to learn from past experiences and adapt our behavior accordingly. The basic unit of intelligent behavior, Piaget called a schema. Schemas are ways in which we try to organize and understand experiences, and in the early days are in the simple form of innate reflexes. Gradually, as the baby develops the schema, they become more internal and the baby starts to make mental representations of the world. That is, it starts to think. Schema develop as a result of experience and are used as a basis for action. For example, a baby may have developed a schema for shaking a rattle. Past experience of picking up rattles has shown that they make a sound when moved. Therefore, the baby now understands or has a schema which guides his, guides his actions when he next grasps something. New schemas are formed and existing schemas developed by the processes of assimilation and accommodation. Assimilation is taking in pieces of information from the environment and reacting to them in the same way, for example, always sucking something put in the mouth, whatever it is. However, if we just continue to use our already existing schemas, there would be no mental growth and we would, as adults, still, for example, suck everything that was put in our mouths indiscriminately and grasp everything using a whole hand rather than our fingers or we'd shake everything that came to, to us. This is where accommodation comes in. In order to take account of different properties, such as whether it's a bottle which produces food or whether it's a blanket which doesn't when the baby sucks it, he modifies the shape of his lips to accommodate different stimuli. When something has been accommodated, a balance exists, which Piaget calls equilibration or equilibrium. That is until something new is experienced and then an uncomfortable state of imbalance occurs. For example, food may start to be presented in a drinking cup or on a spoon. The baby has to adapt its behavior in order to cope with this new stimuli. Now it's the anxiety caused by the imbalance that Piaget says encourages the child to continue trying to understand the world. Trying to understand Piaget's theory is not helped by the use of this very unique vocabulary. Anyway, let's look at a diagram showing where we've got so far. We have innate strategies which make development possible. We are also born with simple reflexes which we can say are assimilated into our behaviour pattern in the form of schema. As we meet new stimuli, we are thrown into an anxious state of disequilibrium. This anxiety is reduced through the processes of assimilation and accommodating our behaviour to create new schema. This reduces the tension and restores a state of equilibrium. And it's this state of equilibrium that Piaget says provides the motivation to try to understand more about our world. If we fit an example to the diagram, babies have assimilated grasping using their whole hand. But eventually they'll find it very difficult to assimilate small objects and will adapt by accommodating to them in developing a new schema for picking them up with a thumb and a posed finger, which of course is much easier. We haven't finished explaining Piaget's theory by any means, but you probably need a change now. So here's a little mental exercise to keep you awake. We have been applying Piaget's theory of cognitive development to babies, but cognitive growth continues throughout childhood and into later life. Even now, we're adapting to our environment, accommodating our behavior, and developing new schema, perhaps one for understanding Piaget's theory. Stop the video for a few minutes and see if you can explain how you might develop, or have already developed, a schema for driving a car. You could explain it in everyday terms first and then try using Piaget's vocabulary. If you found that easy, the rest of Piaget's theory will be no problem. Your answer in ordinary terms might have been that you build on past experiences and skills related to the task of driving, for example, steering and controlling toys, bicycles, shopping trolleys and everything else. From everyday tasks, you know what the words push, pull, turn, etc. mean and you encounter levers and dials. If you're then faced with these in a car, you adapt what you already know to fit in with the behaviour required to drive a car. Yeah.
Having learnt one aspect, such as how to start the engine, you're then motivated to learn more and thus learn everything required to drive a car. You can adapt this idea by thinking about how you would develop a schema for driving a tractor or an aeroplane. Exactly the same applies. You meet a new situation and assimilate it and experience a sense of disequilibrium because you haven't developed a schema to cope with that particular thing. And therefore, you accommodate your behaviour and develop a schema for it. Thus, you're now in a state of equilibrium again and ready to deal with more and more new experiences. We can see that the limited number of schema in the young baby grow rapidly as more and more are assimilated and they become more complex as accommodation takes place and they form the basis of thinking. Because assimilation, accommodation and equilibrium operate consistently throughout childhood and in later life, they're known as the invariant functions. It is these that produce the motivation to develop. Piaget identified four distinct stages of cognitive development. The sensory motor stage, which occurs between birth and two years, the pre-operational stage between two and seven years, the concrete operational stage between seven and twelve years, and the formal operation stage from eleven to twelve years onwards. Piaget claimed that all children pass through these stages in the same order, but at different speeds. His conclusions were mainly the result of testing and observing his own three children, who had the surprisingly normal names of Jacqueline, Lucienne and Laurent. Let us look at each stage more closely. The sensory motor stage, which lasts until the baby is roughly two years old, is the action stage. The baby thinks through acting on objects, that is, grasping, sucking, touching, shaking, etc., and through the senses. Through applying action schema, the baby builds up a mental picture or finds out about the objects and the people around them. What objects can be grasped? what can be sucked, what noise will they make, uh, what they feel like to the touch. In this stage, the child is profoundly egocentric. That is, it is unable to make distinctions between what is itself and what is the rest of the world. Nothing, therefore, has an independent existence until the baby finds out what is itself and what is not. When babies realise the distinction, they learn that objects continue to exist even when they're out of sight. Until the baby has this notion, known as object permanence, out of sight means out of existence. It is thus an important milestone in cognitive development. Piaget suggests that although a three-month-old baby may look with interest at an object when it's waved within range, perhaps even reach out for it or follow it with its eyes, once it is out of sight, it appears to be forgotten. It is necessary at this stage that the whole object is visible for the baby to respond to it at all. It is not until about eight months that the baby will reach for a completely hidden object. Usually at about ten months, the baby will search for an object which has been hidden but if he sees it move to another hiding place, he'll continue to look in the original place. It's only by about 12 months that the child has complete understanding of the existence of, of objects which are out of sight. We can relate this to the study of attachment. It is interesting to note that separation anxiety, where the baby gets extremely distressed when their attachment figure leaves their sight, occurs at around six to seven months, when the baby has formed attachments, but not yet acquired the idea of permanence of objects or people. Children develop the ability to use symbols to represent things towards the end of this stage. For example, they understand that a doll represents or stands for a baby or a person. This is known as the general symbolic function. It is fascinating to watch a child move from dealing with a doll as just another object to be chewed, shaken or thrown, and instead deal with it as a symbolic object which represents something, for example, talking to or feeding a doll. The child makes huge strides in developing its ability to use spoken language during this stage. Unlike symbols, signs, like language, don't look like the things they represent, so are inevitably harder to learn. Piaget, however, sees language as a result of thought, not as a source of it. 
so it is not a key feature in this theory. To summarise the key features of the sensory motor child, thought processes develop using senses and actions, the understanding of objects' permanence develops, the idea that symbols can be used to represent objects develops towards the end of this stage. This symbolic thinking, as well as language, continue to develop impressively in the next stage, the pre-operational. In this stage, the child's thinking is dominated by what it sees rather than by logical principles. The key feature is egocentrism. Piaget considers pre-operational children to be irredeemably egocentric, in that although they are now well aware of self, as separate from the rest of the world, they're quite unable to take anyone else's point of view into consideration. Piaget claims that the child cannot see the point of view of another in a literal sense, in that the child will not understand that an object will be seen differently from another angle of view, and in the sense of being unable to understand that another person might feel or think differently to itself. A well-known demonstration of egocentrism by Piaget and Inhelder, reported in 1956, made use of the tabletop model of a Swiss mountain scene. After an opportunity to become familiar with the model, children were asked to choose a photograph from a selection which showed the view of the scene from the point of view of a doll which was placed at a different angle from the child. To get the task right, the child would have to take the doll's perspective into account. Each mountain was painted in a different colour and topped with either a house, a red cross or snow for clarity. Only children of eight years or over were able to consistently succeed at this task. Six-year-olds achieved some success and four-year-olds typically chose their own view. This would be a simple practical to run yourself if you have access to children of the right age and can build mountains. Alternatively, you could use the modern day version, which we'll demonstrate later. At the beginning of the pre-operational stage, the child also has difficulty in dealing with tasks logically. For example, classifying things, putting things into a logical sequence or series, and understanding relations between categories, for example, apples, and subcategories, for example, red apples and green apples. A four-year-old may be able to separate colored pencils into yellow ones and green ones, or into big ones and little ones, but it's likely to find it much more difficult to take two dimensions into account so as to pick out all the big yellow ones or all the small green ones. You can, you can lie them down if you want to. Are there any more big green pencils? Oh, you found another one. Well, that's a good boy. You did that very well. Thank you very much. Similarly, a child at the beginning of the pre-operational stage, at say three or four, will have difficulty arranging items in order, such as longest to shortest, or tallest to smallest. A child up to five, if shown a garage with yellow cars and blue cars, is likely to agree with you that the yellow ones are cars and the blue ones are cars. However, if then asked, if all the yellow cars drive away, will there be any left? The child is quite likely to say that there won't be any left. Piaget believes that an incorrect answer reflects not merely confusion over verbal labels, but a deeper inability to consider more than one feature at a time. This concentration Piaget called centration. Until a child can decenter, he will be unable to classify in any logical way and will still be unable to, say, tell the difference between cats and dogs. Why? Because he only takes into account one attribute, that is, perhaps that they have four legs, and ignores the other differences. Having acquired this cognitive skill by four to five years old, the older pre-operational thinker still appears to have problems with classification. You can try this example yourself. Are they all cars? Are there more blue cars or more red cars? Are there more blue cars or more cars? Blue cars. You may have had to think a second or two before answering that question, but according to Piaget, six and seven year olds find it very hard. He says the child is failing to understand the relationship between the whole class, that's cars, and the subclasses, the differently coloured cars. The child is still influenced by what it sees. 
it's easier to perceive blue cars than perceive all cars. However, you may want to argue, as many others have, that the question in these, what we call class inclusion tasks, is too difficult to understand. We'll come back to this later. Another feature of this pre-operational stage is when children refer to inanimate objects as if they're really animate or alive. Piaget calls this animism. Thus all kinds of objects have emotions, motives, intentions, thoughts, desires attributed to them wholesale. I expect most of us as children used our teddy bear as a scapegoat for our bad behaviour. This can be seen as a product of egocentrism, as the child imagines everything, and especially every one, to be like itself. It doesn't feel like it. It is sick. So you have to give them some medicine. Conservation is probably the most widely investigated area of the pre-operational child's thinking. By conservation, Piaget means the ability to understand that something remains the same, even though it has been transformed in appearance. A classic example is that of a glass of water remaining the same quantity when poured from a short fat glass into a tall thin glass. A pre-operational child is likely to focus on the height of the water in the tall thin glass and is likely to judge that there is now more water because the level's higher than in the shorter glass. Now then, have they still got the same amount of squash in or has one got more than the other? That one's got more than That one's got more in, right. So if I had that one and you had that one, it wouldn't be fair, because I'd have more. Right, very good, okay. This false judgement is likely, in spite of the child actually seeing the transformation taking place, that is, seeing the water being poured, or even if you allow them to pour it themselves. It occurs because the child's lack of reversibility, that is, they're unable to hold all the features of the situation in their heads, and they can't think about them being reversed. But logic does triumph over appearance same, eventually. Yes. Very good, but they've still got the same now. Yes. Why have they still got the same? Because you poured, because you swapped glasses, but you poured all that in. But does no, it's not the same, because yes. that one is wider than that one. Yes. Very so good. that one goes higher. Very good. Yeah, you're really very good at that, Tim. Well done. Thank you very much. To summarise the key features of the pre-operational stage. The child tends to be egocentric, that is, they see the world from their own viewpoint. They also have problems with classification and tend to centre on one feature at the expense of others. They tend to attribute human feelings to inanimate objects. And, according to Piaget, they are as yet unable to conserve. The third stage, identified by Piaget, is the concrete operational, which occurs from the ages of 7 to 11, approximately. Egocentrism declines rapidly during this stage, probably due to maturation in some part, but also due to playing and cooperating with others. They can understand classifications of classes and subclasses, and can increasingly carry out reversals, as shown by their ability not only to do addition, but also to subtract. The child is now increasingly able to take more than one attribute into account, so they can easily, for example, differentiate animals. Operational thinking is consolidated, and conservation, and most conservation operations, are understood by the end of this stage. Other types of conservation, such as volume, which require an understanding of shape, size and mass, may not be conserved until 11 or 12, according to Piaget, that is. This step-by-step -step acquisition of new operations was called décalage by Piaget. However, the child can still only perform the operations if the concrete objects are physically present. For example, if given an abstract problem such as Joe is taller than Lucy, Lucy is shorter than Maria, who is the shortest, um, the child at this stage will have difficulty. Paul is bigger than George but Henry is smaller than George. Mm -hmm. Can say again? Paul is bigger than George, but Henry is smaller than George. Mm -hmm. so who's the biggest? I'd say Henry. You'd say Henry. Fine. If though the three people were physically present, they would find it very easy to order the height. This type of t task is called transitivity, and many adults, including myself, find this kind of mental gymnastics very difficult. Try this one. Susan likes bananas more than Ken. Ken likes bananas less than Mark. Who likes bananas the least? 
This requires several skills, such as understanding of comparative words, such as more, bigger, less, longer, which we know appear relatively late in the child's development of spoken language. It also requires good visual memory. Children's memories have been shown by Flavel to develop rapidly during this period, with rehearsal and mnemonics increasingly being used. Below six years old, children don't rehearse or use mnemonics, but by six or seven years, they rehearse spontaneously, uh, often aloud and moving their lips, and by nine, rehearsal is spontaneous and silent. To summarize the concrete thinker, conservation is attained during this stage. Classification is no problem, but transitivity tasks still cause difficulty, unless the concrete objects are physically present. The fourth and final stage identified by Piaget is the formal operation stage, which starts at 11, and Piaget thought would be complete by 15 or 16 years. He claimed that this is the highest level of thinking, and that after the developments in this, this stage have taken place, there's very little change to cognitive abilities after that. The key feature is the development of abstract thought. It was interesting to note Flavel's finding that cognitive development seems to take place in line with development of memory skills, and they must play a part, or a major part indeed, in the development of abstract thought, which relies on storage and manipulation of vast quantities of information. Adolescents can now consider such concepts as justice, morality and death, and become concerned about the future and ideological problems. Hypotheses about things not actually experienced can now begin to be generated and tested systematically. Deductive reasoning allows mastery of such complex systems as science, religion, and mathematics. Right, before we go any further, you might like to stop the video and play a game. <laughs> well, why not? One person thinks of an object in the room. You might have played this before. The others have to guess what it is. They have 20 questions, and you can only answer yes or no. Have a go now. Now, think of the type of questions that were asked. A concrete operation thinker would tend to stab at things such as, is it that book, is it this pencil, is it that table? It would be hoped that your questions were more advanced and tried to eliminate large numbers of objects. For example, is it this side of the room, or is it made of wood? Although as the possibilities narrow down, your later questions will obviously be more specific. This could form the basis of a practical demonstration of the difference between concrete and formal operational thought. You could play the game, say, with seven to ten-year-olds and compare their methods with subjects your own age. You could devise some simple scoring system for different categories of questions. Piaget and his colleague in Helder devised the well-known pendulum task, which requires abstract thought, deductive reasoning and hypothesis testing. Given three pieces of string of different lengths, a set of three weights, and three degrees of push on the weight, soft, medium or hard, which factor affects the speed of the pendulum swing? Is it the length of the string? Is it the weight attached? Or is it the force of the push? The answer, in fact, uh, to put you out of your misery, is the length of string, which alone determines the speed of the pendulum. But the important fact is the method used to produce the answer. Again, you'd expect concrete operation thinkers to use fairly um, trial and error methods, perhaps random combinations, rather than some systematic elimination. To summarize the key features of Piaget's final stage, the formal operational, the child can now use full adult reasoning and is capable of all forms of abstract thought. So now that we have briefly covered the basics of Piaget's theory, let us just summarize quickly. We develop units of intelligent behavior, schemata, that's the plural for schema, by assimilating new experiences from the environment. A feeling of disequilibrium occurs, causing us to accommodate our behavior by developing schema to return to a state of equilibrium. This equilibrium motivates us to seek out new experiences, which starts the process all over again. We move through four stages during this cognitive development until we attain adult thought. This is Piaget's view, 
but most parts of his research have been examined, criticised and chewed over, and this has led to a reformulation of his theory. Piaget's methods have always been criticised by the psychologists who favour more stringent scientific methods. Most of his theory is based on the results of the method known as clinical interview, whereby the answer to a question forms the basis of the next question asked, and this makes the whole procedure rather subjective and unquantifiable. Subjective because each participant has a different set of questions, and unquantifiable because the type of data received can't readily be analysed statistically. He is also criticised for leading children in the use of questions and of selectively taking their verbal responses as examples to illustrate a theory that he's already created. The argument is that the process by which his theory was arrived at is not replicable, which makes it untestable. A counter-argument you could put forward is that if Piaget had used more rigorous scientific methods, he might never have produced such a comprehensive theory. Many of the less formal methods, which you may have used yourself, such as the case study, produce very rich, detailed information about a small number of children, rather than very little information about a very large number of children, which we find in scientific investigations. Recently, qualitative methods, such as the case study and observational studies, rather than quantitative methods, such as experiments, using sophisticated statistical analysis, have attracted attention as gradually the limitations of the scientific approach have become apparent. Recent research suggests that Piaget underestimated the abilities of the child in the first two stages and overestimated the abilities of the formal operational child. Others have said that his theory neglects the importance of language and of social relationships, which are so central in childhood and must play a part in our mental development. To Piaget's credit, he has been flexible in his willingness to make modifications in the light of other people's research. There are huge numbers of research findings which disagree with Piaget's. We'll just look at a few of these more significant ones and the more recent ones, starting with the sensory motor stage. Hello. Experiments by Barra suggest that babies may acquire object permanence as early as one month old, much earlier than Piaget suggested. For example, in one experiment with one to four month olds, he made an object disappear by bringing a screen down in front of it. When the screen lifted, the object was not there, and Bauer looked for evidence of surprise in the baby, such as a raised pulse. If the baby shows surprise when the object is missing rather than when it's present, then this suggests an understanding of object permanence. Bauer also showed three to four month olds an interesting object which they might have reached out for. When they start to reach for it, the lights were switched off and infrared lights enabled Bauer to see that the babies still continued to try and reach the object. This suggests that although they couldn't see the object, they still believed it continued to exist. Piaget didn't have sophisticated technology to help him at that time and Bauer suggests that in the typical Piaget test, the baby is just showing immature motor abilities for example, they can't control their head or direct their eyes for very long. A great deal of research has focused on the pre-operational stage. Piaget thought that children at this age were egocentric and not able to take another's viewpoint into account. Their inability at the three mountains tasks demonstrates this. However, Martin Hughes devised a study in which a child has to hide a doll around a cross-shaped arrangement of walls from a policeman-shaped doll. To do this successfully, the child has to take the policeman's point of view into account. The test was repeated with two policemen, requiring the child to coordinate two viewpoints. The children were trained beforehand, and if they made a mistake, it was carefully explained to ensure that they understood. The results were dramatic. 90% of children between three and a half and five gave the correct answer, whereas Piaget claimed that children under eight couldn't decenter. Perner argues that children are not egocentric, but intellectual realists. He based this assumption on research which shows that children seem to interpret the Three Mountains task as requiring them to pick out the picture which best shows reality as they know it. 
This tendency to represent what they know is, has really been highlighted in children's drawings. For example, if children know that a car has four wheels, they draw four wheels, even if they can only see two. Stop the video now and consider what other explanations there might be why the Three Mountains task and the Policeman Child experiments found such strikingly different results. These could be methodological differences, as well as based on the task required. Well, there are many possible reasons, and it's probably a combination of several. First of all, Hughes made sure that the children had to run through what they had to do, as well as making sure that they understood the language involved. The scenario of hiding from people was a familiar one. As Margaret Donaldson says, it makes human sense to the child. The familiarity of the policemen and the walls make it even more relevant. Many children have never even experienced mountains. There are also no right or left reversals required in the policeman task, and the word direct hands-on experience rather than just photographs to look at. This practical can be easily carried out using Lego or making cardboard walls. We adapted the materials to carry out a demonstration ourselves, similar to the Three Mountains task, in that it required left-right reversals and used photographs, but with the difference of using training and familiar objects. A set of photos were produced, showing each of four viewpoints. After training, the child was asked to select their own viewpoint and then that of Pink Panther from where he was sitting. Come back and sit on me. You can see that one. Very good. OK. Well, that's lovely. Thank you very much indeed. That's been very helpful. As would be expected, we didn't get quite such impressive results as Hughes, but we certainly found five-year-olds who could pick Pink Panther's correct view. Piaget's methods of research into conservation may also have underestimated children's abilities. In his original conservation of number, for example, two rows of equally spaced counters, which the child agrees are identical, are then transformed by the adult. Typically, pre-operational ch children say that there are less when the shape of the row changes. However, in McGarrigal and Donaldson's study, they used an accidental transformation condition in which a naughty teddy is produced by the experimenter, which then messes up one row. Compared with the adult deliberately changing the rows, many more four to five-year-olds appeared able to conserve if it appeared to be an accident. Nielsen replicated the results of McGarrigal and Donaldson, but when they asked the children to explain why the two rows still had the same number, there was no difference in the numbers who gave a logical reason between the intentional adult condition and the naughty teddy condition. It seems possible then that children simply disregard the transformation made by Naughty Teddy as irrelevant or as part of a game, while taking that performed by the experimenter very seriously. Thus, they're likely to give a superficially correct answer, which overestimates their ability to conserve. We can see from these studies just how difficult it can be to get reliable answers out of children when testing them with their very limited ability to express their thoughts. The type of language used in experiments is central to the interpretation of the results. Children's understanding of adult language is limited and questions need to be devised that match the level of language development of the child. There are also many other ways in which the question or task can be misunderstood due to social expectations. The child has a certain set of beliefs about adults which may affect their response, such as adults always tell the truth or no one asks a question twice without a good reason. Take a typical conservation of length study. The adult asks, are they both the same length? Then transforms the sticks, straws, pencils or whatever, and then asks the very same question again. Obviously the child may think that the adult expects a different answer, or they wouldn't repeat the question. These sort of questions also assume that the child knows the meaning of the words length or longer. Paul Light has suggested that all testing conditions introduce very subtle biases, and in the case of conservation experiments, it may be the need to give what they see as a socially acceptable answer, which will please the adult. The phrasing of the question, nonverbal communication, and experimental design can all affect the child's response. Yes, they are. No, because that was like no, that. no, because if you move them back like that, like that, they're both the same size. It's just that you're moving them. These 
biases have implications for education and the methods teachers use to question pupils in the classroom. No, no. And it's got toes. Can you think of some questions you could have asked me? You could have said... Light designed a condition of the conservation of liquid experiment whereby instead of liquid being deliberately transferred to a differently shaped glass for apparently no good reason, he discovered that one glass was chipped and he casually replaced it. The cues picked up by the child from the adult in this incidental condition may be that this transformation makes no difference, just ignore it. And this is exactly what children do, and they conserve. There are many sound logical reasons that we might give in the conservation of liquid, for example, why the liquid is the same. We might note that the height in the glass is compensated for by the width of the fat glass, or that if the transformation was reversed, that the quantities would seem to be the same, and of course that nothing has been added or taken away. However, it's probably unrealistic to expect a just conserving child to be able to tell you one of these reasons, even if they knew them, and this makes it difficult to know if the child is a conserver or is just guessing right. Flavelle pointed out that both false positives and false negatives are possible in this kind of task, that's to say that a child can give a correct answer without having the cognitive skill we're investigating or it can fail to give a correct answer when it actually possesses the skill. Cowan made the valid observation that most conservations are approximations anyway. If you know something about physics you may take into account the differential evaporation from the surface of the liquid in the two glasses or the residue drops left in the first glass after transfer. If a child sees a drop of water left in the glass, does he or she see it as empty? Moving on to research findings related to the final stage, the formal operational, Piaget thought that most people reach formal operations and apply it generally to everything, but it seems that he was wrong about this. You may like to test yourself by pausing the video for a minute and answering this question. What would happen if no more babies were born? concrete operation thinker would respond by looking puzzled, saying it was silly, or refer to something concrete that would actually affect what they would see, such as there wouldn't be any more babies in the street. A formal operation thinker would be able to deal with such a hypothetical situation um, with ideas such as the effect on the future of mankind, the importance of existing sperm banks, or the crippling effect on the baby care products industry. But don't panic if you didn't think up formal operationally on this occasion, though you undoubtedly need to in studying something as abstract as psychology. Research carried out by Nymark found that only 30% of adults use formal operation thought at all. The usual way to test this is to give a battery of formal operation tasks involving abstract thought, problem solving, etc. to subjects of 11 years upwards. An experiment by Martirano, for example, gave 10 different tasks to 80 different subjects in groups aged 11, 13, 15 and 17 years. It was found that the older students did much better, that there were a major spurt in um, formal operation thinking between 13 and 15, and that all tasks were not found to be equally difficult. In fact, it was found that only two 17-year-olds showed formal operational thought on all tasks. Concrete thought is, after all, quite sufficient for everyday use, and if your life doesn't demand it, you may have very little practice at using formal operation thought. So these findings, and many, many others beside, suggest that Piaget's stages exist, but that the ages he suggested were not entirely accurate. This may be due to the fact that he tested small samples, used his own children, who had professional parents, and that many of his tasks, and the language he used in them, were not relevant to today's children. There has been much debate about the role of language in developing thought. Jerome Bruner agrees with Piaget about the importance of innate structures in helping us to organise our world and to develop thought, and the importance of the child's active interaction with the environment. However, for Bruner, language and logical thinking are inseparable. Language doesn't reflect what the child is thinking, but actually shapes thought. Language provides the means of transforming experience and can directly help the child to think for example, by focusing attention on features in the environment, by encouraging or categorization, problem solving, acquisition of knowledge, and allowing hypothetical thought. However, for Piaget, 
Language is merely a tool to be used in operational thinking. Children experience first, and then use language to represent their thought. Research to choose between the two points of view has been based on the suggestions that training speeds up children's cognitive development, but the results are mixed. In general, the debate tends to favour Piaget's position, and we may accept that while language may be necessary for operational thinking or symbolic thought to develop, it is not a sufficient cause. Overall, Piaget's theory has been of major importance in being the first to show us that children are not just mini-adults, that children are not just less knowledgeable, that their thinking is qualitatively different from adults, that a child must go through the actions himself rather than learn from adults, that children go through the same stages of cognitive development in the same order, but at different rates, that children are very limited to their own perspective of the world, and there's no point in arguing logically with young children as they don't have adult logic. Only maturity and experience can help a child to develop thought, and the experience should be in the form of doing. These ideas have helped to shape the way we bring our children up and the way we educate them in schools. We now know that parents and teachers need to provide children with the freedom and opportunity to have a wide range of active experiences which they can assimilate and accommodate to. Strictly speaking, the child can't be taught, but its cognitive growth can be facilitated. Schooling provides the child with opportunities to use their natural curiosity to actively explore the environment. Play is very important as an active process in which children directly act on their world and make sense of it. Play is a major way in which the child learns in preschool and offers a model for learning beyond that. There's no doubt that nursery and primary school practice now has a much greater emphasis on discovery learning and activity-based work which takes into account the likely readiness of the child in cognitive terms. It is now clear that concrete objects must be used to introduce new concepts and that what children learn must be linked to ideas that they have already experienced. The teacher's task then is to promote cognitive growth by providing a challenging and stimulating program of activities which are appropriate to a child's developmental stage. With older children, science and maths teaching programs are now designed to take into account the jumps into operational thought and into formal thought and offer appropriate hands-on experience. However much face validity Piaget's ideas would seem to have, it is important to know if they work in practice. The Nuffield science programs now being used relate well to Piaget's ideas and to the extent that they're effective, they can be seen to validate his theory. In preschool education, Piaget's ideas have now become conventional wisdom. Evidence for effectiveness, though, is dogged by disagreements about what effectiveness is, let alone how to measure it. Is education to acquire skills? Is it to learn knowledge? Is it to develop as a human being and take your place in society? The lack of agreement on where the emphasis should fall is reflected in debates on the value of educational testing and it makes it very difficult to say that Piaget is right or wrong. In general, though, Piaget's work can be considered to have had a liberating and highly beneficial effect on conventional education. Jerome Bruner, who we mentioned earlier, was greatly influenced by Piaget's work and developed his own theory of cognitive development, which has many similarities. He agrees that we're born with an ability to organise our world, and that maturation and environment interact to produce cognitive development. But Bruner sees development not in terms of stages, but in different modes of representing the world. He specified three ways in which we can gain knowledge and understanding. The first of these is the inactive mode. The child represents objects and actions through the motor behaviours that go with them, just as adults may still best represent some routine behaviours in terms of actions, such as putting on makeup or shaving. The second mode of representation to emerge is the iconic, from the Greek word image. The child of roughly the same age as, as in Piaget's pre-operational stage deals with the world in terms of images, that is, what it looks like. This can be seen in the child's failure at conservation tasks. Now, both Bruner and Piaget agree that a change of major importance occurs at the age of around six to seven years. For Piaget, it is a shift in, into operational thinking, but for, for Bruner, it's the ability to use the symbolic mode of representation, his third mode. 
Movement into this symbolic mode occurs, Bruna believes, as a result of language. The power of symbolic reasoning is neatly demonstrated by Bruna and Kenny's well-known study requiring children to reorder a disturbed array of glasses of different heights and widths. You can recreate this experiment easily using any ordered groups of objects or materials. We use some type of plasticine. The children have shown the logic of the arrangement and then asked initially to rearrange the order of the pieces. They are then asked to re recreate the array in mirror image order. Typically six-year-olds can recreate the display but have great difficulty with the mirror image bit. And you fill in the rest. <laughs> However, according to Bruna, seven-year-olds and above who are now able to think symbolically and are no longer tied to the image could do this. They relied upon verbal cues to guide them, such as gets fatter going one way, gets taller going the other way. The child using images can only reproduce. The child using symbols can reconstruct. The major difference between Piaget and Bruner's theories is the role of language. Piaget believes the move to logical thought is through the acquisition of operations. Bruner says the leap from iconic to symbolic is due to the development of language. Without language, Bruner says, human thought would be limited to what could be learned through actions and images. That is, there would be no symbolic thought or abstract thought. Now what of future research in cognitive development? Grand theories are now out of fashion, but detailed and painstaking research continues apace. Major areas of recent research interest are metacognition and the theory of mind. I'll tell you a little bit about each. Metacognition means developing a greater awareness of our cognitive activity. It is being aware of our own memory, our own comprehension, our own language and our own ideas. In other words, it's knowing what we know. As one researcher, Robinson, points out, being aware of having heard something but not having taken it in, possibly this video, uh, because you're distracted of thinking about something else, is an example of a metacognitive experience. You're aware of your own cognitive processes, at least to some degree. Children become increasingly able to do this and are therefore able to control their own learning through use of good learning and memory strategies. Another researcher, Markman, showed that children of five were less aware of their own cognitive processes than seven-year-olds. You can show this yourself by following his procedure. You'll need some five-year-old and seven-year-old subjects. The children are given incomplete con instructions about how to do a magic trick or how to play a game and note their reaction. The five-year-olds will tend to carry on doing the task and they aren't successful, whereby the seven-year-olds will realise early that they won't be able to do it because they had incomplete instruction. They'll ask questions about the task and may point out that the instructions were inadequate. Um, they're obviously more able to run through the task mentally before attempting it and to discover what they didn't know. This control over your own mental processes is obviously very important for successful learning. Poor students could be said to be those who are unaware of what they know and what they don't know, that is, those with poor metacognition. In theory of mind studies, researchers are interested in finding out at what point children start to become aware of their own and of others' cognitive processes. When do they develop an understanding that others have independent minds of their own, and when do they develop their own theory of how the mind works? It's early days yet to have many findings, but there are some recent ones, for example, uh, some research by Leslie. A child is told that Sally hides a sweet in a box and then goes out, and that Anne then comes in and finds the sweet, moves it to a basket. The child is then asked to say where Sally will look for the sweet when she comes back. Will the child say what she knows, or will she understand that Sally will still think her sweet will be in the box? Three-year-olds generally get this wrong, but four-year-olds get it right. In our adaptation of Leslie's experiment, the child sees Pink Panther hide two sweets under a policeman's helmet and then go off shopping. While he's out of sight, Naughty Teddy moves the sweets to another helmet, and then Pink Panther returns from the shops. Give him a kiss. There we go. Now then, where's Pink Panther going to look for his sweeties? Under there. But they're not there, are they? Then you're going to look under there. And then you're going to look under there, and where will you find them? Under there. Well done. This is illustrated by another recent study, this time by Perna et al. They showed the five-year-olds a Smarty tube and asked them what was in it. Naturally enough, they all thought it was Smarties. It was then revealed that it only contained a pencil. Some children recognised their false belief, while others said they thought it contained a pencil all along. 
The interesting point here is that when asked what another child would think was in the tube, they all answered pencil. So although able to admit their own false belief, the children are not able to understand where their false belief came from and so cannot correctly predict how another child would answer. In fact, the majority of children under four cannot admit their own false belief. Research in this area is continuing and interesting spin-offs shedding light on cognition and autism, for example. Recent research with autistic children suggests that they have failed to develop a theory of mind. Harris has shown that autistic children are unable to understand what other people are likely to believe and what other people's wishes may be, thus preventing them from relating normally to others. He called this a social cognitive deficit. This type of research highlights the close relationship between the social and the cognitive development of the child. As we said earlier, Piaget tends to portray the cognitive development of the child as separate from his social world. Research now is trying to redress the balance. We now know vastly more about cognitive development than we did even ten years ago. and We could think of this as a painting in of Piaget's already drawn sketch. Detail is added and sometimes the composition is changed, but the basic picture is recognisably the same. We gain enormously in richness and detail, but sometimes the outlines get a little hazy.